Good afternoon and welcome to the National Hispanic Council on Aging's Caregiving in the Time of COVID-19. My name is Christina Pacheco and I am the Director of Resource Development and Policy at the National Hispanic Council on Aging. It's my pleasure to be moderating today's webinar. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the National Hispanic Council on Aging is developing innovative ways to continue engaging, informing, and listening to communities. For 51 years, NACOA has been working to improve the lives of Hispanic older adults, their families, and caregivers. This year is no different. This afternoon, we will be addressing the issues of health and well being for caregivers. The topics we will discuss today include COVID 19 and older adults, preventive measures for caregivers, recommendations for caregiving, and for those who are caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease and dementia, caregiving and diverse populations, policy recommendations amid or aimed at protecting caregivers and resources for caregivers. This will be a robust webinar with experts from all over the caregiving arena. The format will consist of one panel related to caregiving followed by a facilitated question and answer session at the end of the panel. As we progress through the webinar, please ask your questions in the chat box. I must note that this webinar would not be possible without the generous support of our many sponsors. So thank you to Pharma, Lyft, the Diverse Elders Coalition, Avi, AARP, and Lilly. Let's get started. It is my pleasure to welcome our president and CEO of the National Hispanic Council on Aging, Dr. Yanira Cruz. She is one of the nation's foremost advocates and spokespersons for diverse older adults and is nationally and internationally recognized for her commitment and leadership in the aging arena. Welcome, Dr. Cruz. Christina, for uh, moderating today's webinar. And thank you to all the panelists uh, for being here today, for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, and for helping all of us uh, empower our communities during this um, difficult moments we are facing. I also want to take a moment to just say thank you to the frontline workers who are caring for, for our communities across the country, ac across the globe. Specifically, wanted to, send, to say, um, send gratitude to all our nurses, our medical doctors, police, farm workers who are picking up, um, who are picking fruits and vegetables for us to eat, and those who are working at the supermarkets, and, and of course, our caregivers who are caring for our older adults and for our families. Um, I, you know, I would be remiss not to say that we are living very challenging moments at this point that, that require all of us to work together. As you probably have seen the statistics, older adults are being hit um, drastically with the coronavirus. And as a result, our caregivers are suffering tremendously from this impact as well. Eight out of 10 deaths today are older adults. And um, we, uh, as, as many of you know, we, we have housing facilities for older adults. One of our housing facilities in, in Washington, D.C. has been impacted. Um, the organization conducted, um, we wanted to make sure our residents were healthy, and so we have worked with the D.C. government to get everyone tested at the housing facility. Um, all of our residents are over the age of 65. They're low income, and it's a very diverse population in that housing facility. Um, the results came back this week, and we were um, we were sad to hear that um, five five of our uh, of our residents came back with with the coronavirus. So um, of course we are taking the necessary steps to quarantine them and to make sure that the uh, the um, the the virus gets contained as quickly as possible. Um, I think Casa Iris is, um, is very lucky that they were able to get the, the test done and the DC government cooperated with us and the George Washington Medical Center as well co cooperated with us. But I, I share this story with you to, to, to showcase what is happening across the country and across, um, across the globe with older adults. 
Um, so let us um, continue to keep a close eye uh, for our older adults. Let us continue to advocate and ensure that they get uh, the necessary information and the necessary support so that they can remain healthy and we, pre we can preserve their lives for as long as possible. So, um, so again, uh, I, I want to just reassure you that um, we at the National Hispanic Council on Aging are committed to continue to empower and, and equip our communities with the necessary information and resources to stay healthy. And the reason why we're doing this webinar today, and we have asked all of you panelists who, who I trust and who I know um, love our community and are dedicated to our to the well-being of our community to come forward and and um, and empower and provide information for our caregivers um, today. So with that, I want to just say um, thank you from the bottom of my heart for for everything you're doing. And uh, for those of you who are listening and uh, attending the webinar, thank you for for what you are doing in the, in our communities. I ask you to please pass on the messages that you will hear today. Um, only together uh, we will be able to contain this virus. So thank you again and um, enjoy the, the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Older adults are especially vulnerable when it comes to COVID-19. Research has shown that adults 60 years of age and older, especially those with pre-existing medical conditions, are more likely to have severe, even deadly coronavirus complications. This may be due to the fact that as people age, their immune systems change, making it harder for their body to fight off diseases and infection. Many older adults are also more likely to have underlying health conditions that make it harder to cope with and recover from illnesses. During this time, family caregivers are under additional stressors. Not only are they dealing with their everyday caregiving tasks, but they are also faced with additional health concerns that come with COVID-19. They could also be facing job uncertainty, isolation, and their own health concerns. Our first speaker today is Dr. Henry Pacheco. He is a family physician and expert on Latino health. He has more than 25 years of experience in medicine, public health, and infectious disease. He has served as medical director for several of the nation's leading Latino organizations. Today, Dr. Pacheco will educate us about COVID-19 and older adults. Welcome, Dr. Pacheco. Hello, can you hear me now? Oh no, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Now. Okay, all right, that's great. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and, uh, and uh, your uh, brief review pretty much covered uh, a great deal of what I'm going to say, the most important points. The other thing I just realized is that, uh, believe it or not, I thought this uh, presentation was going to be in Spanish, but, uh, obviously in English, so, but that's no problem. Uh, let me just get back uh, directly into, uh, into the topic of my conversation. I'll cover mostly some of the more clinical aspects, but to be honest with you, most of the clinical aspects, most of the most important work gets done outside of the hospitals, outside of the clinic or the health uh, systems uh, is, is, is done in the community. In any case, just very briefly, this uh, COVID-19 belongs uh, is a disease. It's a viral disease, and like most viral diseases, there are no uh, significant cures, uh, no significant medications. There are vaccines for some, uh, for many viral diseases, but there's still no vaccine for the uh, coronavirus, the COVID-19 that we're going to talk about. This virus belongs to to a family of viruses called the coronaviruses that you know have other diseases, uh, brought other diseases, some very serious uh, like SARS and MERS, and uh, you know the, the, the influenza. But this particular uh, this particular virus is, is 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 very high risk, very new to us, and is causing significant problems as you can tell in it, not just in the nation, in the whole world. Uh, the yeah, population most at risk and that we're going to discuss is, of course, Latino older adults. In general, older adults, those who are 60, 65 and older, are more significantly impacted by this uh, virus, probably 
Um, because of their lower um, uh, immune system, the, 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 the strength of the immune system is lowered uh, as we age. And also because older adults have a lot of uh, uh, system conditions that makes them more, more vulnerable to the virus. Nevertheless, uh, we should not uh, lower our guards and think that this is just a disease that affects old people. Uh, as they say, uh, it, it's affecting a significant number of young people, people in their 20s and their 30s, and it's also affecting children in, in, in some different ways. Uh, although this is uh, a typical respiratory virus, I and mean, then we'll get a little bit of the, and the, and the symptoms, this virus is also very treacherous because it's affecting other systems of the body that traditionally we don't associate with this respiratory virus. It's affecting the heart, it's affecting the kidneys, and it's even causing, you know, um, strokes and, 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 and emboli in, uh, in, in different parts of the body. So it's a very, uh, it's a very high risk, a very tricky and very vicious uh, virus. Um, it, they, let me just uh, first get into the risk of, of contagiousness, which is probably the most important thing for us to, to know uh, about contagiousness and how to avoid it, which is the best weapon that we have uh, so far. Uh, first of all, uh, the reason why Latinos are so highly impacted is not because of any necessary genetic or ethnic predisposition, but, but simply because they are uh, in contact mostly with uh, a lot of people. They work in crowded conditions where there are a lot of folks there. They work in restaurants, hotels, and they come in contact with the public in closed, uh, in enclosed settings. Uh, uh, they work as uh, you know Uber drivers, uh, cab drivers, and and, they, and also at home. You know, they, many many Latinos live in in, in in let's say crowded home environments, multi family, which uh, in under other conditions are are nice uh, home settings where you have you know three four generations living together. But for viruses, for any respiratory and contagious disease, it is harder to keep other members of the, of the household from becoming infected. Um, this virus is, uh, is highly contagious and it can disseminate very easily through the air. It's a, it's, it's a respiratory virus. It affects, uh, it infects uh, uh, person to person and also from uh, objects. How do we get, get it from other people? Well, uh, for example, when we shake hands, when we give a kiss, and, in the face or when we're very, very close in, in, in people, uh, we can become uh, infected by this virus because it gets disseminated through the air as we talk. We're always spitting little, tiny, little, practically invisible droplets of saliva. And also when we sneeze or when we cough, these uh, droplets become suspended in the air and they can actually float quite a bit of a distance. So one of those, uh, one of those strategies which is to stay at least uh, uh, two meters or six feet away is, you know, works somehow, but not totally because they can travel significant distance. But at the mi very minimum, that is one strategy. It's highly contagious, uh, and it, 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 is a, it doesn't through the air. But we can also catch this uh, this virus from from objects. It's been it's been shown to that it that you can it, it survives in, in in objects such as doorknobs, uh, pieces of uh, mail. Uh, uh, just anything, any object that we can touch, uh, sometimes after two weeks, but mostly, you know, three days a week is where you can live the longest. Three days on paper and, you know, five, six, seven days on glass, which means that we should be very careful uh, when we touch doorknobs, uh, uh, the, uh, the stairs, the, the handrails, and things like that that are constantly being touched. Those are the ones we have to be careful about not to come in contact with or to clean regularly when it's at home. Um, uh, as I said, the Latinos, well, they work in places where they're exposed to a lot of people uh, and, 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 and therefore there's a higher risk of passing from one to the other. Same thing with farm workers. They work in close contact. They, they, they hand uh, bags, uh, uh, instruments from one to the other. So a lot of risk. Um, uh, older adults who live alone, uh, you know, they don't have to go out and go shopping. They have to go to the supermarket, and they are, therefore they, they become exposed to other people. Uh, likewise, uh, older adults who live in, 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 in nursing homes have, are also becoming highly infected, and, and these are the population most at risk is because nursing homes are crowded, but also because there's very close contact between the the, 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 the attendants, the nursing attendants, and the patients. 
and it's therefore it's very easy to pass it from one to the other. So folks who live in, in, in nursing homes are at a very high risk of becoming infected, which means that families should keep an eye on their on their relatives. Um, and the, the conditions that put, put us more at risk besides age is also having pre-existing conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, asthma. Uh, these are uh, uh, diseases that put, uh, that are, put us at a higher risk of having complications. Same thing people who are immunosuppressed, uh, people who are living with HIV or people who have uh, you know, cancer or other diseases that are met with them under immunosuppression are, 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 are at high risk of, of uh, of getting infected and, and, and for the uh, virus to take hold. Uh, treatment, for, for now there's no treatment for the virus, there's no direct treatment, there's no single medication that attacks the virus or prevents it from multiplying in the body. There's also no vaccine, and this is very important to highlight because there's a lot of, uh, you know, internet, radio, television commercials of all kinds of uh, spokespeople, television people, politicians, actors, uh, television doctors who talk about uh, you know, cures that they know, uh, treatments that they know, pills that they know that work, all these uh, 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 herbs and all these uh, combinations. None of them are proven to work. And so the best thing is simply to follow those, uh, those uh, prevention strategies because, as we know, there is no treatment yet has been found and there's no vaccine. Best thing, of course, is, uh, is to avoid the risk of contagiousness. How do we do? First of all, do not touch your face. If you, you know, unless you just wash your hands, right? If you haven't washed your hands, do not touch your face because the virus gains entry to the eyes, to the mucosa of the nose, the lips, and the eyes. So do not touch your face at all, and especially your hands, nose, and, and, and lips. Very important, wash your hands. Wash your hands. The minute you come into the house, the first thing you should do is just wash your hands. Wash your hands when you're touching all kinds of objects and, 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 and things like that. When we go out, the best thing is to use a, a mask, uh, those you could buy or those you can make yourself. There's an internet, lots of, you know, people who show how to make masks. But at the very least, you know, wrap a scarf around your, your, your nose and mouth because that prevents those little droplets from getting into your mouth. Also use uh, uh, gloves, those that, that you can throw away gloves that are not, hard, not easy to find. But, uh, you know, if you can't wash your hands, definitely use your gloves uh, when you go out and, and when you're touching everything. Most important, physical distance, maintaining the, what is called social distance of at least six feet between people, uh, it, 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 especially when, uh, when you're outside and, uh, and, uh, and you come in contact with everybody. Uh, secondly, at home, uh, be sure to clean all substance, uh, substance, uh, surfaces that are touched by the general public or even by family members, doorknobs, hand rails, uh, stair rails, everything. First, soap and water, just clean it all. And then after that, disinfect it by using, you know, either those common disinfectants you can buy, such as Lysol or Clorox, or simply use, you know, the, a, a solution of one tablespoon of bleach in a quart of gallon or in a liter of gallon of water. Mix that and use that in a rag and just go over and clean first all the, all the surfaces, and then you can uh, disinfect them with, uh, uh, I mean, you can disinfect it with the Clorox uh, after having cleaned it with soap and water. As, as I mentioned, the virus can live up to four or five days in, 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 in substances. Symptoms, signs and symptoms, of course, are very serious. Cough, high fever, chest pain, chest pressure, headaches, and, 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 uh, and uh, sore throats, muscular, muscular pains. If the person is in shape that, you know, doesn't seem to be very serious, it's just, you know, like a bad, bad cold, for example, they can be taken care of at home by one single person, but that's, Single person that takes care of them has to follow all of these very strict guidelines of isolation, wearing masks, to avoid passing it to others. Now, if that person starts getting worse, uh, then, you know, uh, you, you, you might have to seek medical attention by either uh, uh, calling 911 or, or calling their, their doctor or calling a hospital prior taking them and taking them. Who should be taking them? Well, people who, have, who are having significant respiratory uh, distress, people who are having significant chest pain, people who look uh, lethargic with confusion, older adults with lethargic confusion, definitely, if anything, like the lips are turning blue, these are, uh, these are very, very urgent uh, signs that this person should be treated in a hospital setting or an emergency room setting uh, because uh, uh, it can, that can progress to, to serious death, uh, to serious uh, disease and death. But there are many people who actually, uh, you know, after uh, two, three weeks of home care, 
uh, actually, uh, you know, come out of it okay. Uh, there are lots of uh, people who, who, who let's uh, use the word, survive the illness without having to go to a clinic or to a hospital. What does the virus cause? The virus infects the gonzal passages, the lungs, uh, mainly causing severe bronchitis, in many cases a significant pneumonia. If the pneumonia is so significant that, that impedes respiration, then the people have to be hospitalized, put on oxygen, and sometimes in intensive care units where they need intubation. That's when it gets very serious. Uh, the virus also causes all kinds of other problems, drops in, 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 in blood pressure, a failure of kidneys, a liver, a multi multi system symptom failure. It's a treacherous virus when it when it gets out of hand. But once again, many people have done have actually, uh, you know, after two three weeks of bad coughing and fevers, have actually been able to make it through at home with home care. Now, the person in charge of care and caring for these folks at home, either the family members, best if it's just limited to one person uh, that pays for that person and that for all those. Uh, uh, treatments uh, that all those um, uh, uh, strategies from uh, from preventing getting infection. As far as uh, tests, there are two types of tests. One that that uh, one test which is uh, detect whether you have the viral infection, and another test which shows that you have antibodies. That means that you have survived. The test is only important once you know you're, you're under medical care to be sure to know whether this person really has a viral illness or has but may have some other illness that is not necessarily COVID. Uh, that, that is usually managed by healthcare system. How do you get the test? Call the health department and find out if they have the test, where are they giving it, and if it's important for you to take it. Not everybody needs the necessarily test. Then the other test that shows Dr. That Pacheco? Is giving after the disease. Yes, this is uh, the end of my line. Yes, <laughs> thank you. All right. so I know much. there is a lot of information to share. So if you will hold on and um, wait for the question and answer session, that would be fabulous. I sure will. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank Pacheco. You. So I want to remind all of our attendees that if you have any questions for our presenters, please type them in the chat box and we will address as many of your questions as possible during the question and answer session. As the older adult population continues to grow exponentially, the demand for caregivers is increasing. Caregiving while a task of love can also be stressful and hard. Family caregivers are more likely to experience emotional distress, depression, anxiety, and or social isolation than those who do not have a caregiving role. Our next speaker is Dr. Adriana Perez, an assistant professor and senior fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. As a current scientist funded by Penn Center for Improving Care Delivery for the Aging, her research is focused on the influence of community level factors on the well being of Spanish speaking older Latinos with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Today, Dr. Perez will address protective factors to help caregivers stay safe and well during COVID 19. Welcome, Dr. Perez. Thank you so much. It's great to be with everyone. Um, at, next slide. Next slide. I just want to share up front that some of this work is funded by the National Institute of Nursing Research as well and the National Institute on Aging through a Resource Center for Minority Aging Research uh, grant at the, at the Center for Minority Aging here at the University of Pennsylvania. Next slide. My work builds on previous studies that I conducted in Arizona, um, specifically Phoenix, Arizona. And now um, for the past five years, I've been uh, studying uh, the uh, health outcomes for Latinos in Philadelphia, uh, trying to understand the migration of Latinos to the East Coast, and especially those that are experiencing high levels of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. As all of you know, this population is expected to grow exponentially by 800% in the next 20 years. And we know that people that are living with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias experience significant impairment, both the older adult and the caregiver, um, as it relates to health-related quality of life. For diverse individuals with Alzheimer's disease, quality of life is influenced by many different factors, behavioral, social, cultural. But my interest now is looking at community and how community 
can either hinder or support um, well-being in this population. I think that this offers us a very good lever to create interventions that are not only adaptable, but that could be sustained um, over time and that can be embedded through policy and working with diverse stakeholders. Um, as uh, Dr. Cruz was mentioning earlier in terms of this uh, COVID-19, what I'm finding out in real time as we're conducting our studies is that COVID-19 has really impacted this population even more so. Um, the uh, heartbreaking consequences of forced isolation, when you think about it with those that have Alzheimer's that really depend on their social network and not just their family, but even neighbors, their providers, their formal and informal caregivers is really crucial. So the CDC has said that this, is, this uh, as a special population is really at higher risk for not only developing severe COVID-19 illnesses, but also um, other um, health consequences as a result. Next slide. And so this, um, just to kind of give a context to why, how this work is being informed, um, when COVID um, uh, hit, I was uh, working on delivering a nursing-based intervention that was delivered to caregivers um, in the home to, to try to improve sleep, symptom, sleep health in both the uh, caregiver and the older Hispanic uh, person with Alzheimer's or dementia. It was going very well. We actually had just completed our study and we were in the final phase of co uh, collecting outcome data and we got through that. So basically we were just at a point of, of three month follow up to see if the uh, families were keeping up with some of our interventions when COVID hit. Uh, at the same time, we were looking um, at the neighborhood and factors that inclu include things like uh, crime, noise, density, poverty, and to look at how these factors impact domains of quality of life that include physiological factors, symptom, function, health perceptions, and so forth. Next slide. And just to, to kind of give you a visual, uh, I really study kind of what I feel is the foundation of the environment here and specifically crime, housing value, noise, density, you know, how many people live in the neighborhood. When we talk about social distancing, it's very difficult in communities where there's a, a high population of multi-generational families living together in close quarters. And we know that all of these things um, add to the stress sleep quality, stage of disease, comorbidities, and obviously quality of life. Next slide. These are some of our participants. Uh, we uh, it had over 100 um, individuals, dyads of both um, caregiver and older adult, um, Latinos, African-American, and white. Next slide. So this is what I wanna show, and I could, there are several maps, but I just wanna sh show this one. This is the, um, so the bubbles are the crime index. The bigger the bubble that you see, the higher the crime. The yellow section is where Hispanics and Latinos live. The green is where African-Americans live and the red is where white participants live. So just to um, uh, kind of take us through this very briefly, you could see that the higher crime is where Latinos, Hispanics live. And it's the same for poverty, density, and noise level. Next slide. So this is kind of the most important slide. So I'll just walk us through this uh, very quickly. Um, so what's important to remember here is that we already know that there are individual level factors that are protective to our health. How resilient we are, our faith, the social support that we receive from family, el familismo, that those we know are protective factors. There are decades of research that show that. Um, Hispanic caregivers, though, have reported, and this is consistent with other research from colleagues at other RICMAR centers that show that the support uh, to the older family members when you live in a neighborhood with high cohesion, meaning that there's a lot of engaged neighbors watching out for one another, have fewer depressive symptoms than those that in less cohesive neighbor, uh, neighborhoods. So engaged neighbors, how do they help us? They allow us to um, keep our older adults aging in place. They provide additional support. They may be a basis of emotional support. They also can assist though with everyday kinds of processes and tasks. 
transportation, help with going, uh, help with doing work outside. These cohesive neighborhoods are showing that they actually protect and serve as a buffer to the adversity, the challenges, the burdens that caregivers face on an ongoing basis. And so they're integral to, to our support process and I encourage us to build community with our neighbors, being the eyes and ears for one another. Um, I, I love the, the, the tag in this presentation is like, we're in this together, uh, juntos podemos. All of that is a very um, positive way to deal with this and work through this together. So I just wanna close by saying that, um, you know, we have to invest more in these kinds of, of uh, factors, you know, beyond just looking at individual, we need to build a community, invest in our community, address issues related to crime and safety because our older adults really depend on it as well as their caregivers and families. Thank you. And I, and I will leave a little early, so I wanted to include for everyone in the final slide my contact information. I would love to stay in touch. Uh, Dr. Cruz has my contact information, but um, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez. Caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease during the pandemic brings with it additional challenges, especially given the physical distancing measures put in place. Challenges to daily routine are very difficult for people with Alzheimer's and related dementias, especially with the added stress it creates for them and their caregivers. Our next speaker is Beth Kallmeyer, the Vice President of Care and Support for the National Alzheimer's Association based in Chicago, Illinois. As Vice President of Care and Support, Ms. Kallmeyer oversees the association's programs and services nationwide for individuals with Alzheimer's and their families. She also oversees outreach to long-term care professionals and diversity and inclusion initiatives. Today, Ms. Kallmeyer will share with us recommendations for caregivers caring for loved ones with Alzheimer's and dementia during the times of COVID-19. Welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. Next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, we already heard today a little bit about what uh, the specifics of, of COVID-19 and the coronavirus. Um, but one of the questions I get a lot is, uh, do people with uh, living with Alzheimer's or dementia, are they at an increased risk? And they're not at an increased risk for the disease just because they have dementia, but they are at an increased risk because they're older typically, they have other comorbid conditions. Uh, and then when, when you take into account the uh, cognitive impairments that make it more difficult to follow hygiene protocols and to um, uh, social, social distance, those types of things, it does make them perhaps at greater risk. Next slide, please. So the Alzheimer's Association has worked hard as, as everyone has been learning about what this uh, pandemic means. Uh, and we created some specific tips for caregivers providing care for somebody living with dementia in their home. And, and one of the most important things we know, we've heard it on TV, we, we heard it today in the presentation, we hear it everywhere, everywhere. Um, in newspapers, we have to wash our hands. The guidelines from the CDC talk about this. And that's, that's simple enough, right? We can wash our hands. But when you have somebody that has cognitive impairment, um, they might not remember to do that. Um, depending on where they are in the course of the disease, they might not know how to wash their hands for 20 seconds at a time. Uh, and so some of the recommendations uh, that we have is that perhaps the caregiver puts, the, um, puts a schedule in place for hand washing. Maybe it's every two to three hours. Everybody in the house is gonna get together and we're gonna wash our hands. Um, also putting up signs in the bathroom to remind people, not just to wash their hands, but to wash their hands for 20 seconds. Um, and maybe putting a sign up in the kitchen. Um, these things are important and the caregiver um, needs to think about them for themselves, but also to remember that the person living with dementia uh, might need additional assistance. Next slide, please. So another really important factor, uh, and this one hasn't been talked about as much, 
Um, but the person living with dementia might not be able to tell you about some of the symptoms that they're experiencing. And in fact, there's, there's growing evidence to show that sometimes the, um, the way COVID occurs for people uh, that are infected if, and living with dementia is that you might first see that they, they get this um, rapid increase in confusion. So um, a change in behavior that's very, very different and it's a, it's a sudden change. Um, of course, things are changing with dementia or Alzheimer's uh, over time, but those, those changes tend to be slower. Um, so if you see a rapid increased change in their behavior, their ability to answer questions, their ability to do certain things, um, we're recommending that you call your healthcare provider. And again, not to run over to the ER, um, we want to avoid that if possible. Uh, Medicare has allowed for telemedicine sessions. Um, so call your healthcare provider uh, and avoid the ER unless um, unless the person is having any life-threatening, of course, uh, symptoms like difficulty breathing or, or, or really high fevers. Um, some other things that caregivers can do um, it, to avoid having to leave the house as, as much as possible is to use those mail prescriptions, uh, have those delivered. Um, but also think about making plans for helping you as a caregiver if something happens to, to the caregiver. Um, so having a conversation with your family about who might be able to step in uh, in case something happens uh, to the primary caregiver. Of course, we don't want that to happen, but it's always helpful if we have those plans in place before a crisis uh, strikes. Next slide, please. Another thing that's really um, important, and especially as people are, uh, are isolating and uh, family caregivers might not have access to even other family members that have helped out with the caregiving, if perhaps they're trying to limit the number of people that come in contact with them. Um, so, so it's important for caregivers to think about how to put a schedule in place every day. Um, so that we know what we're going to do ahead of time and, and be intentional about creating some different activities that you can do together with the person living with dementia, um, wanting to make sure that we don't um, watch too much of the news, that we're not uh, paying attention to that too much because it's stressful. It's stressful for everybody. Um, but people living with dementia might not be able to um, really understand fully the context of it, and so um, they can they can get more confused. So we want to make sure that we're limiting um, that type of thing and setting up um, activities and tasks around the house that you can include that person living with dementia in those tasks uh, to help them have a sense of accomplishment as well. Next slide, please. Caregiver stress is always something to keep in mind when you're a caregiver for somebody living with dementia. Of course, it's a, it's a long road um, and it goes over many, many years with, with the dementia getting worse over time in most cases. So um, we always talk about how important it is for caregivers to take care of themselves, but now it's even more important than ever and it might be more difficult. Um, but one of the things that we talk to caregivers about is, you know, you are the one providing care. If something happens to you because you're not taking care of yourself, who's going to step in? And so really stressing the importance of making sure that caregivers find some time and, and perhaps ask for some help from limited uh, other family members to make sure that they're um, taking care of themselves, whether it's getting a break or attending a support group virtually or, or getting a walk in. Next slide, please. So some families um, rely on outside home, uh, home care providers to help them provide care for the person living with dementia. And it's really important that you as a caregiver have discussions with these home care providers to make sure they're taking uh, steps and following protocols uh, when you're bringing somebody into the home. Uh, and so making sure that you're checking their temperature, asking if the agency tests, make sure they're wearing a mask. These are all things that um, families uh, can do if they're working with these care providers. Next slide, please. So if you have a, um, a family member that's living in a care facility, these are difficult times. 
um, not being able to visit your family member is devastating. And what, what those caregivers need to remember is that they are keeping those folks safe. They are, it is very, very important that outside folks that could be asymptomatic caregivers are not coming into those facilities and getting them sick because there's too many people too close together. It's very, very hard to mitigate the risk there. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very important to, to not be visiting. However, um, we're encouraging families to reach out and, and work, with the, work with the community to see how you can stay in touch, whether it be on a webinar or uh, FaceTime or, 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 or whatnot. Next slide, please. So um, some people are concerned. You've all seen on the news the, the, the uh, long-term care communities that are having lots of uh, big, large outbreaks. Um, and families say, well, should I bring, should I bring my family member home? Uh, and there's, there's just a number of questions that you should ask yourself uh, if you're doing that. And you can ask um, these questions of the facility to see how are they managing this? Do you feel like they're, um, they have the, the right number of staff or the staff sick? These are questions that you can reach out to the facility and ask them about. And, in the interest of time today, um, the Alzheimer's Association has all of these considerations for you on our website at alz.org. Uh, next slide, please. Moving to another facility is uh, another something else to consider. Again, you don't know if there's going to be other cases at that other facility, um, and so it is something to um, weigh carefully. Next slide. And moving a person home, same same idea. The family might not be able to provide the level of care that the person needs. So sometimes it might be better to keep the person there, um, but there's no right answer to this. That's the most important thing to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So lastly, I just wanted to let everyone know that the Alzheimer's Association has a 24 seven helpline. You can speak to uh, a, a dementia specialist or a master's level clinician any time of the day or night and get personalized help. Next slide. And lastly, um, the association is also offering um, virtual programming. So virtual support groups or virtual education programs if you would like to learn more. Thank you, Christina. I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ms. Kalmeyer. According to the Caregiving in the U.S. 2020 report conducted by AARP and the National Alliance on Caregiving, today more than one in five Americans, or 21.3%, are caregivers, having provided care to an adult or child with special needs at some time in the last 12 months. This totals an estimated 53 million adults in the United States. The demographic characteristics of caregivers remain largely unchanged since 2015. Caregiving remains an activity that occurs among all generations, racial ethnic groups, income or education levels, family types, gender identities, and sexual orientations. Our next speaker is Jenna McDavid, the National Director for the Diverse Elders Coalition policy advocacy organization working to improve aging in communities of color, American Indian, Alaska Native, and LGBT communities. Ms. McDavid mo monitors federal, state, and local policies that impact aging in diverse communities and creates dynamic responses that support, honor, and protect diverse older adults. Today, she will speak about caregiving and diverse populations during COVID-19. Welcome, Jenna. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everybody. Nice to be with you this afternoon, and thank you so much to the National Hispanic Council on Aging for the opportunity. Next slide, please. I want to start my presentation briefly with an overview of who the Diverse Elders Coalition is and what we do. Some of the names on this slide might be familiar to those of you in the audience. Our organization was founded in 2010 by six major national aging organizations working in communities of color, LGBT communities, and American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Our members, while representing different and diverse constituencies, have commonalities that we found that we could address more effectively if we pooled our resources and created a stronger political voice to advocate for older adults and caregivers' needs. Next slide, please. 
One of the major initiatives that we have undertaken over the last few years is a focus on family caregiving in the constituencies that we serve. Anecdotally, we've been hearing for years through our member organizations that the health and the well being of older adults is largely dependent on the health and the well being of the people who take care of them. And in our communities, those caregiving structures and those family structures may be different than what we understand to be the mainstream or the norm. We were funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation in 2018 to undertake a multi year research, training, and education grant to better understand what exactly is going on with family caregivers in diverse communities. What are their challenges? And importantly, what are their resiliencies? What keeps them going and keeps them caring for older adults when sometimes other structures are not available to them? Next slide, please. We started the grant with 18 months of planning and research. So again, Primarily to this point, what we'd had were anecdotes and stories and things that we heard from being in sites like Casa Iris or working through our senior community service employment programs and hearing about some of the challenges that caregivers were facing. But we wanted to really quantitatively understand what caregivers were experiencing. So we partnered with the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging to do a nationwide survey of family caregivers for older adults. The survey was available both online and in person. So folks who were visiting our senior centers, folks who were um, working with our CSEP program were able to obtain a survey in person. And we also translated it into eight different languages, including with in partnership, the National Hispanic Council on Aging. We had a Spanish language version of the survey because we really wanted to reach a broad audience, in particular an audience of caregivers who often are left out of research. Next slide, please. Over the two months of survey collection, we received about 1,200 responses to the survey, and we were able to use about 900 of those surveys in the data analysis. Some of the questions that we were asking were about the health, the mental health, and the economic security of caregivers, as well as the health, mental health, and economic security of the people for whom they were providing care. We wanted to better understand what were some of the things that caregivers were struggling with, and importantly, what were some solutions that we as national policy advocacy organizations or our partners who are health systems, community-based organizations and individual providers, what could we come up with as solutions for them to better reach family caregivers in diverse communities? Next slide, please. In addition to the survey that we conducted, we also did a series of focus groups. So we conducted 36 focus groups in 15 cities uh, eight different languages were spoken by participants in the focus group, and altogether we reached 218 participants with these focus groups. We wanted to take some of the concepts that we learned about in the caregiving survey and expand on them. We wanted to understand the faces and the stories behind the numbers that we had seen. Next slide, please. So these are some really high level and probably unsurprising insights that we got from the survey and the focus groups. What we heard in the survey and the focus groups was that the caregivers in our communities are really struggling when it comes to self-care. They're overworked, they're overwhelmed, they don't have a lot of support from formal services. In fact, in the responses to our survey, we found that an average of less than one supportive service like respite care or adult daycare or support for understanding legal and financial issues were being used. So that's less than one of those types of services being used to provide support to family caregivers. They don't know where to go or where to turn when they need support. Additionally, we found that in language and culturally competent resources were few and far between. Caregivers in our communities don't often receive information on diseases like COVID-19 in a timely, trusted, and truthful manner. We know that hospitals and doctor's offices lack professional medical interpreters, and when offered, they're often not used. Uh, we know that family caregivers are asked to stand in as interpreters at the doctor's office, and that is a huge burden on family caregivers to be asked to be that go-between between, between the older adult and the provider. And similarly, we heard about experiences of discrimination, of racism, of homophobia, and transphobia on the part of providers when caregivers were seeking services. 
many caregivers felt that assumptions were made about them when they walked into the provider's office and about their ability to provide care or their ability to understand instruction. And so we have a lot of data to dig through, but what we do know is that many of the concerns that we heard about in our surveys and our focus groups are heightened at this time of COVID-19. We saw enormously high rates of anxiety, depression, stress, and strain, and we know that those are exacerbated right now during COVID-19. We also know that isolation for both the older adults and the caregivers is higher now under COVID-19. So we're thinking about ways that we can take this research and use it to provide comprehensive, culturally competent resources, both for caregivers themselves and for providers. Next slide, please. We've created a resource guide on our website, which you can access at this URL, diverseelders.org slash COVID-19, that provides some of the solutions that our members, like the National Hispanic Council on Aging, are offering to individuals, to caregivers, to older adults and providers at this time. We have, for example, an automated telephone helpline that's being launched by the National Asian Pacific Center on Aging in eight different Asian languages. You can call them and get information and referrals and resources in the languages that you speak. The National Hispanic Council on Aging has a robust media center on their website with information in English and Spanish for providers and for consumers. The National Indian Council on Aging is hosting a weekly telephone town hall with tribes who want to understand how to file for emergency financial support from the U.S. government or how their members are accessing services when we know that COVID-19 is really disproportionately impacting Indian country. I would encourage you to visit our website. The website is active and live and we're constantly updating it as a PDF file is also available that you can download, print, and share. Next slide, please. I know I only have a couple more minutes here, but I wanted to wrap up with one of the really promising and exciting findings from our research. And that is on average, all of the different communities who responded to our survey expressed a strong cultural commitment to caregiving. And what that means is that on average, the people who were in our survey said that they were caring for an older adult because it was the thing to do, because their culture expected it of them, because they wanted to give back to older adults in their families and in their communities who had cared for them when they were young. And so we know that there's a wealth of power, of resilience, and of cultural heritage that we can tap into when we're talking to caregivers, especially during this time of COVID-19, when we know that certain communities are being disproportionately impacted by the disease. So those of you on the call who are healthcare providers, who are social service providers, who are doing good work in your community to reach diverse elders and caregivers, know that when you do so, you're reaching communities who have a powerful respect for older adults, who feel obligated to care for them, and who want to create stronger communities and protect their cultural heritages through caregiving. Next slide, please. And the last thing I'll say is that all of this research, which we are still understanding and still digging into, is going to become a part of some of these tools and resources that we're developing for training uh, for healthcare providers and social services provider providers, which you can find on our website at diverseelders.org slash caregiving. We will be launching in the next few weeks uh, an online training that you can take free of charge to better understand some of what we found in our research and some of the solutions that we have, not just for COVID-19, but for caregiving in general, which uh, issues and caregiving, issues of caregiving in diverse communities existed long before COVID-19 and will continue to exist long after. So we look forward to sharing these research and resources with you. And if you have any questions, uh, next slide, please. Please feel free to reach out to me. That's my email address. And then our website and our social media accounts are listed here on the left. We look forward to connecting with you. Thank you again to NICOA for all of your work and for all of you on the call, everything that you're doing to support caregivers in our communities. Thank you, Ms. McDavid. According to NICOA's Status of Hispanic Older Adults Insights from the Field, the Caregiving Edition, Family caregivers provide extensive assistance for activities of daily living that include things like eating, bathing, and dressing, and instrumental activities of daily living, which include managing finances, transportation, shopping, and meal preparation. This unpaid care provided is valued at approximately $470 billion annually. We know that this amount will increase uh, due to COVID-19. 
to ease the stresses that affect the physical and mental health of caregivers and to address the need of the caregivers of caregivers is it's important for policymakers, politicians, stakeholders, and others to work together and find solutions to protect caregivers during this pandemic. Our next speaker is Gabriela Prudencio, the Hunt Research Director at the National Alliance for Caregiving. She manages a comprehensive research strategy to support policies and initiatives for unpaid family caregivers across the aging, healthcare, disability, and long-term care sectors. Today, she will speak about policy recommendations to protect caregivers during COVID-19. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect, thank you. So um, I'm very glad to be here today uh, representing the National Alliance for Caregiving. We were established in 1996 as a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to improving the quality of life for family caregivers and those in their care through research, innovation, and advocacy. And now if you can move forward two slides, please. Next, thank you. And I'd like to start with the definition of caregiver, uh, which we use as the same definition as the Race Family Caregivers Act, as a family member or other individual who has a significant relationship with and who provides broad range of assistance to an individual with a chronic or other health conditions, disabilities, or functional limitations. So it's for the purpose of this um, presentation only, as I know that uh, different organizations for different purposes will use a different definition. Next, please. And I'd like to uh, start by saying that I'm very proud to present some of the data that, from our study that we just released last week on caregiving in the US to highlight the issue of caregiving as a public health issue in the United States. Five years ago, there were 43.5 million caregivers in the, uh, in the US. Today, there is 53 million caregivers. Five years ago, it was 18% of the adult population. Now it's 21% of the adult population. And more importantly, and related to Hispanics, is that 3.4 million um, children today are supporting in one way, one way or another, some of these 53 million caregivers. So 3.4 million children are secondary caregivers, and this number does not include primary caregivers of their children, since we were not able to survey them. Next one, please. And I'd like to, next slide, please. I'd like to um, start by providing some statistics that are relevant to Hispanic caregivers. And as I read these statistics, please bear in mind that these statistics were fielded before COVID-19, but they are all very related to COVID. Um, and what, what it means is that many of, it is very likely that the conditions for, for many of our Hispanic families that are caregiving uh, may have intensified during these past couple of months. So first of all, the typical Hispanic caregiver is younger than the average caregiver, is 43.3 years old. More likely, they have a children living in their home. They are often lower house, of low, lower household incomes. Usually they are caring for a parent or a parent-in-law or a grandparent. They live, with, most likely, more than other caregivers, they are likely to live with the person that is receiving the care. And also they are in high intensity care situations, which means they are spending more hours a day and a week caring for their care recipient. And also they are providing care with activities of daily living, such as bathing, changing, eating, changing a diaper. Next, please. And so it's important to note that Hispanic caregivers are really financially strained Compared to uh, other ethnicities, they are facing more challenges uh, having to balance both work and caregiving. Most importantly, they are facing way more financial strains. Uh, I want to highlight here that 15% um, of 
Hispanic caregivers said that they are unable to afford basic food, basic uh, items like food due to caregiving, 15% of Hispanics who are caregiving. So this is, this is alarming, and this was before COVID. Next, please. So uh, I also want to highlight here a few very important data points that we should take into account as we think of what are the needs of caregivers that are Hispanic today in the face of COVID. First, our survey notes noted that Hispanics are less likely to have health insurance. They are less likely to plan for the future financially, but also other types of planning. They are likely to receive, receive less information from doctors, from healthcare professionals. And also they are more likely to request language appropriate resources. Next, please. So here, um, what's important here is that I've just mentioned a, a bunch of um, issues, right, that are, that, that are important to caregivers during the times of COVID. We talked about financial strain to the point of food insecurity. Um, we talked about lack of information uh, sources from doctors and providers. Also, we talked about the need to, for appropriate English language materials. I also mentioned that planning in the, for long-term is lacking. Uh, also, we mentioned that um, that uh, family care, uh, that Hispanic families are more likely to have children at home and they're providing at the same time for parents who are at home. So now if they're quarantining, they are both providing for a parent and caring for a child while working. And if they are in the frontline workers, then the situation is more strenuous. Um, and so the, this slide is something that we've been workshopping with our research collaborative members, a way to really think about what are the needs of caregivers during the times of COVID, and we've kind of bucketed them in five, five categories. Um, usually caregivers of all ethnicities. Uh, the needs are self-care and emotional support. Shared decision-making is important because we're talking here about advanced care planning, end-of-life decision-making, things like palliative care, Grief is very important today because especially for people who are uh, in institutions and um, if there is if, if there is death, then there is, you know, you, there is a complicated grief, grieving, there is a risk of complicated grieving. Then we have care coordination. Uh, the other bucket of needs were that caregivers provide physical um, care in the form of ADLs and medical nursing. So all of these, like I, I try to kind of highlight some of the very important needs for, especially for Hispanics policy-wise. And here a few of them were workplace benefits, income security and food security, and access to services. And when we talk about access to services, specifically care, transportation, information in general, but also information on advanced care planning, end of life decisions, and respite. I think I still have a couple of minutes, but let me know if I don't. Okay, so, um, so there is good news, less good news, and there's hope, right? So for good news is that Congress has stepped in, and as you know, there is a National Family Caregiver Support Program which provided um, you know, various supports for caregivers through um, e economic support and also additional supports through services um, so that caregivers can provide care to their, law, to their care recipient. The last good news is that some of this legislation is not taking into account families who the care, whose services were cut off at quarantine, so they may be less, access, less likely to be able to access daycare for their care recipients, or maybe they were less, as, uh, less likely to access certain supports. There is some legislation right now, uh, which is the HEROES, uh, so it, it, would, it would solve a lot of these uh, gaps in coverage, so we do hope that um, 
Senate approves it, but that's a still um, it, still to be to be seen. Um, but these are short-term fixes. So I think the main point that we highlight here is that many of the vulnerabilities of Hispanic communities are really highlighting issues in the system. So the system itself is broken. And here, there is a real opportunity for us to work together, not just depending on the government, but also private sector and community leaders to come, come together and really take this as an opportunity to develop long-term solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Prudencio. With more than 40 million family caregivers helping loved ones with care in the United States, it's expected that COVID-19 will increase the number of family caregivers who are providing short-term or long-term care to older adults. It's important to highlight that family caregivers are essential in the health and care of older adults. Our next speaker is Amy Goyer author of Juggling Life, Work and Caregiving, and she is nationally known writer, speaker, and consultant specializing in caregiving and family issues. Ms. Goyer serves as AARP's national family and caregiving expert, columnist, and spokesperson, and she moderates AARP's Facebook Family Caregivers Discussion Group. Let's learn more about AARP's resources and guidance for family caregivers, specifically how to create a plan for those that are caring for someone who is at higher risk of serious illness if infected with COVID-19, and how to support those new to caregiving during this pandemic. Welcome. Hello, thank you so much for having me as a speaker. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. I want to um, go over with you today some of the resources that AARP has in place to support family caregivers during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Look, I see a typo. It's supposed to be COVID-19, not COVID-9. <laughs> um, if you can go ahead to the next slide. We know that caregiving can be a very rewarding experience. We, It's a labor of love for many. It's, it's something that we feel that we want to do for, in many cases. Um, this is a picture of my dad. I cared for him. He had Alzheimer's. Uh, for more than a decade, and my mother at the same time, and my sister at the same time. My dad um, lived the longest, and he had uh, uh, almost Alzheimer's and lived with me for six years. And um, he died at the age of 94, just about two years ago. So I know from very personal experience caring for my family as well as my grandparents when I was younger that it can be extremely rewarding. It's probably the most important thing I've done in my whole life and, and had, there's a lot of joy in it. But if you can go ahead and hit the, uh, the next, it can also be depleting at the same time. So this is we know this about caregiving. Um, we give and we give and we give and then we can end up empty uh, and not have the energy to keep going. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, and what we're finding is that with COVID-19, there's extra added layers of pressure and challenges. You've heard that from all the speakers today, that it, it makes an already challenging job even more challenging. We are even more isolated than we were before COVID-19. Um, we have our supports have changed. Uh, home care workers may not be coming to work. Uh, in person, person support groups aren't meeting in person anymore, maybe online or on telephone groups. Counseling or healthcare appointments are not happening so much in person. Um, and respite care may that we may have had in place in the past is, is not necessarily taking place now, whether that's in the form of an adult day center that your loved one goes to, or if you have someone coming into the home. So, and we also know that again, fear, anxiety, depression are part of this whole pandemic. Everyone is feeling this across the world. But then you add that onto all of these, those are common feelings when you're caregiving. Um, so they are magnified now. Safety precautions make everything more complicated. You heard about um, um, hand washing and all of the things that we need to do. And medical appointments, as I said, for your loved ones, you're maybe trying to do telehealth appointments, telemedicine appointments. You may not have the correct technology to be able to do that. It can be just a little bit daunting. Um, and 
the separation from loved ones who are not living with us, who we are not caring for in the community, but who are living in facilities. The separation is agonizing. And I'm hearing over and over and over again from family caregivers that it is just um, the, it's worse than uh, they ever thought it could be because they feel they aren't able to be there for their loved ones. They don't know what kind of care they're getting. Go ahead to the next slide. What I found in my caregiving experiences, um, I had a real aha moment where I realized I, I didn't expect my car to run on empty, but I was expecting myself to and to be just as efficient. And I find that caregivers, you know, we, we feel a sense of guilt if we take care of ourselves or we just don't have time and we, we don't schedule it. And we, it, there are lots of reasons why we don't take care of ourselves. But I found when I started looking at it in a very practical way that, okay, the gas car uses up gas, I use up energy, I have to fill myself up as well. Go ahead to the next slide. And I developed this technique that worked really well for me. So I share it with other caregivers where I, I found these four ways to fill myself up. And when you're caregiving, you don't have a lot of time. So mostly we do the quick tank fillers. And there are still many things we can do during this COVID-19 outbreak. There, there are little things that add up little by little to fill us up whether it's um, making a good cup of coffee or talking with a friend, connecting with someone. Premium Phillips take a little more time, uh, maybe taking an online class, connecting, listen, going to a webinar, um, organizing something that makes you feel good, being creative, connecting with people. Connections are very, very important. Tune-ups are usually time away from caregiving, which can't be done now. And uh, for many people who are living with their loved ones. So maybe this is a time to plan and dream for that in the future, but there are also other ways to sort of escape, whether it's watching a movie or reading a book, or maybe you get short-term help in the home. Some people are still having caregivers come in the home. You may have a t you know just a, a couple nights where you have someone spend the night so you can sleep well. Routine maintenance is not uh, optional. Uh, sleep is number one priority. We've heard about that today also from the other speakers. I find for me that that is, I can't function if um, I, mentally or physically or emotionally without good sleep. So we need to do all of these things and be mindful and mind our mindsets and, and um, try anything we can to create a calm space in our home, but also seek and accept help. And we need to do this on a very regular basis. Next slide. In fact, that is the first step in the special fact sheet that AARP put together on preparedness for caregivers during COVID-19, and that is to pull together a team. And our team may have changed now because of the circumstances, but it may be that pe some people are, are telling me that they have loved ones who are a little more willing, family members who are willing to make a phone call on a regular basis to their loved ones who are isolated, or um, maybe do a grocery store run. You know, who's going to help you with these things? Things. Number two is to inventory essential items. If, if loved ones are living in the community or living with you, then do an inventory on a weekly basis. What do they need? You know, personal uh, supplies, household supplies, incontinent supplies, medical uh, equipment and supplies, all of the things to make sure that they don't run out of something um, because they haven't thought about it. Uh, medications are obviously another thing. We, we encourage people to have extras. Sometimes the insurance won't fill for more than extra. So it's, it's helpful to look at uh, changing to mail order prescriptions or um, seeing if your insurance will cover a three month supply at once. Many drugstores are delivering now, so we need to help people understand how to do that. Um, create a plan to stay connected, um, both for the caregivers and for those you care for. It's important for all of us to, whether it's phone calls and video chats um, and or online support groups. Um, our Facebook Family Caregivers group has grown in, by leaps and bounds during this time because people need to connect. Maintain personal safety and self-care is, is the next one, of course, and we've talked about that. Go ahead to the next slide. Pull to, uh, the, the other situation that we have done a lot of work on at AARP um, is loved ones who are living in nursing homes or assisted living. AARP put together these six questions that family caregivers should be asking. Um, and you can find these on the AARP website. 
Has anyone tested positive for COVID-19? What is the nursing home doing to prevent infections? Whether it's keeping uh, those who are infected separate from other residents, are they having meals together? Are staff going from unit to unit or building to building? Does the staff have the proper PPE like face shields, masks, gloves, et cetera? And are they trained in how to use it? And if not, what's the plan to get them that training? How are they helping patients and families communicate? Um, we've heard some really creative solutions that they're doing, whether they're doing window visits uh, with telephones. Um, I've, I just recently saw where a, a nursing home has created a plexiglass uh, little cube with three sides so that the residents can sit in the cube and family members can come from the opposite direction and sit outside and communicate with them. How will you keep residents and family updated on important information and that it's important that the facility is communicating with the family members on a very regular basis? And is the nursing home fully staffed? Do they have nurses, aides, social work, activities, therapy? In other words, is your loved one getting the care that you expect? Next slide. ARP has uh, many resources available now for COVID-19. Um, the primary website for caregiving is aarp.org slash caregiving or aarp.org slash cuidar is the uh, Spanish version. We have all kinds of tips and tools and many articles um, uh, there. Nursing home uh, information at aarp.org slash nursing home. We also have a Spanish version. Next step, next slide. Um, we have general COVID-19 resources, everything from our teletown halls, videos on topics like telehealth, how you taking care of yourself, staying at home. There are many, many scams and fraud that are cropping up, taking advantage of people in these situations, how to handle work issues, insurance, et cetera, all related to COVID-19. And AARP has created a new initiative called AARP Community Connections or Mi Comunidad. And we have, um, place there where people can register their mutual aid groups, uh, neighbors helping neighbors, uh, people doing grocery delivery for each other and help just helping each other out. And we created a special AARP Friendly Voices, which is a phone number um, that you can call to sign your loved one up to get a phone call from a, friend, a trained volunteer, just a friendly voice checking in, in English or Spanish. Next slide. We also have these additional AARP uh, caregiving resources from our caregiving support line, which is available in English and Spanish, our family caregiving site, which I mentioned. We have many caregiving books, uh, including my book, um, how-to videos, and many of those are also available in Spanish. We have an online community, a, a community resource finder in partnership with the Alzheimer's Association, and of course, our family caregivers Facebook group, which I moderate. And we have a free guide, AARP's Prepare to Care Guide um, is available in Spanish, and you can get all of these links um, at aarp.org. If you want to go to the next slide. I know this was all very quick, so if you have any questions or would like to um, get more on these links, please feel free to contact me in any of these ways. And I'll look forward to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers for informing and educating our audience on caregiving related issues. We're going to begin with the question and answer session. So again, if you have questions for the presenters, please write them in the chat box. Um, it looks like we've got a question for Dr. Pacheco. Um, there's a few. So someone wants to know if you have the formula for creating a um, home-based disinfectant. Give him a moment to unmute himself. Yeah, the, 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 one of the best homemade and easiest ones to make are the ones that are made with, with Clorox bleach, where you dissolve, uh, you know, a, a two tablespoons of Clorox bleach, bleach in a quart of water. So that makes for a good disinfectant. Perfect. The other question, Dr. Pacheco, is there's a lot of information going around about should people be wearing masks? Should people not be wearing masks? I know there was mixed information that came out um, from public health officials, and now there's concerns that maybe masks um, are limiting people's oxygen. Can you help 
uh, shed some light on those myths? Well, yeah, there are myths. You know, in general, people should be wearing masks for both the protection of the person wearing the mask that keeps him uh, free of those droplets that are floating around, and if that person happens to be one infected even before they have symptoms, when that person coughs or when that person sneezes or coughs, the, the mask traps those in there, doesn't allow it to spread. If a person is wearing a mask, and it's a, you know, a reasonable mask, and that person's feeling short of breath, then, you know, that person could have other problems uh, that are causing that short of breath. But, uh, or the mask has been made at home and it's a little bit too confining. But a regular mask should not be that confined that keeps you from getting oxygen, you know. So in general, wearing the mask when you're outside is the best, uh, one of the better protections that we have. Thank you. Now we've got a community health worker in the audience and they want to know what the most important message is that they should share in the community. And this is for anybody, any of our presenters. Can I uh, volunteer a comment, which is not a question, of not course. an answer? Yeah, first of all, the CDC in their website have a very good uh, 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 slide presentation and tools for community health workers. All you have to do is Google, uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, community health workers and Latinos, CDC, and you'll fall into it. The, the best message is just one of prevention, you know. I think that's the best thing. And what's the prevention? Keeping your distance, not touching your face, wearing a mask, washing your hands. Prevention is the best strategy uh, for this disease. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any of our other presenters, words of wisdom for our community health workers who are on the line? This is this is Beth Kalmeyer from the Alzheimer's Association. I, I would say that if, if you're talking to people that are caregivers, whether they're dementia caregivers or not, that they have a conversation with their family about putting a plan in place uh, if, should they need it and, and to make sure that they're getting the help that they need uh, responsibly, of course. This is Amy with AARP. I would just um, stress again the AARP Community Connections or aarp.org slash um, website where uh, local community uh, organizations can sign up um, and you can find resources and, and help. Again, neighbors helping neighbors. And it might be that there are some in your area that have kind of sprung up or are, have changed their focus and right now on COVID-19 to make sure that they are listed there so those in your community can find them, but also that you can refer people there. Thank you. So another question, and again, this is for any speaker. There is a widening digital divide in the Latino community, as well as for older adults, um, keeping many from accessing the information necessary to stay engaged. What recommendations do you have to address this issue during COVID-19 and going forward? Well, if I'm a volunteer, you know, there is among older adults, but you know, most uh, most of the uh, you know, people that surrounding young adults and children have access to the internet. Now we are trying to get people to distance themselves socially. So the best thing is to just ask, uh, you know, the the younger uh, members who may have, uh, uh, you know, smartphones or access to to uh, the internet, to you know, get uh, information from them. Uh, however, the problem with the internet is that it flooded with very, very bad information, you know, I and mean, just terrible stuff, you know, Coca-Cola with, with mixed with this, with ginger and all that from people who, who even have MD degrees who seem to speak with authority. So it's very confusing. I think one another good source is, is also the news, but just the news when they're talking about when the speakers happen to be from the health departments or from community health centers, you know, there's another resource just call a community health center in your area and just ask whatever questions you have. Uh, in most cases, 
they will answer your 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 your, your questions. Uh, they're very busy, so it's hard to get. But community health centers they are a great resource. The health department is calling directly the health departments with a question, and the legitimate news. You know, the, those six o'clock, seven o'clock news, where you can get you know more stuff, mostly good information that is you know factual. This is Amy. Oops, sorry. This is no. Amy with AARP. Just real quick, um, uh, AARP does have many uh, videos showing you how to use technology. Um, I, I realize that one of the biggest problems is actually having devices to be able to use the technology. But if uh, someone has them, but they don't really know how to use them, AARP has created a lot of very simple how-to videos, whether it's how to FaceTime or or use Skype or um, you know, very simple aspects of technology, and many of those are available in Spanish as well. And you can find those on the AARP website in the technology, uh, personal technology section. Um, I, in terms of, of access to devices, I think that that is a much more difficult uh, challenge. This is Gabriela. Go ahead. This is Gabriela with the National Alliance for Caregiving. So, I think it's also important for community leaders to understand the underlying um, challenges that that are putting Hispanics at the lower end of the stick. And that's why in my presentation, I was talking about, you know, the fact that many caregivers, many Hispanic caregivers don't have access to certain services, including information, um, and that they are also facing some, some definitely income disparities and even food insecurity. So from this perspective, I think there is an opportunity here for community leaders to, to, to connect the communities with resources in, the, in Spanish or, um, you know, language appropriate and, and community appropriate. So there is a little bit of work for communities to do, but I think that they, my, my recommendation would be to do it based on, on the underlying uh, conditions. Thank you so much. Um, Amy, one of our participants said that your Facebook family caregiver discussion group is so needed at this time. Um, do you know of any groups like this that are available in Spanish? That's a really good question. Um, I know that we have uh, quite a few, few members who are bilingual, um, but I am not per personally familiar with any Facebook groups that are in Spanish. You know, I, I will look into that and, and get back to um, the National Hispanic Council on Aging in case that you they can get back to you. But uh, you make a very good point. I do believe there are some online support options that are in Spanish, but I don't have any links or specifics to give you, sorry. This is, this is Beth Kallmeyer. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has some Spanish uh, support groups, some of which may be uh, either uh, uh, webinar type support groups or um, video, I mean, or, or even some which might be telephonic. So they could go to alz.org and find those. And they would, we do have some in Spanish, I know. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, please follow up with us uh, the National Hispanic Council on Aging will have all these resources uh, listed on our website and in our different blogs. Again, thank you to our sponsors, experts, and attendees for joining us today for today's virtual event. We invite you to follow us on our social media platforms. You can find us at, at NHCOA at, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And visit our blog at www.nhcoa.org for the latest information about public health issues, including topics discussed today and for upcoming webinars. We will be doing a series of these that are COVID related, um, specific to different topics that our communities are interested in. Remember, you are not alone. We are all in this together. And thank you again for your attention.